godly prayer. Verse 9. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for all endurance, for all, impati- or for, all imp- for all patience, with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Father, help us this day in many regards as we look at Your Word this morning. God, we ask that, for one, You would teach us how to pray. Teach us how to pray for our families. Teach us how to pray for our church. Teach us how to pray. And Lord, also, that you will show us what it is that you want us to do, how it is that you want us to live, that we would learn that from the way the Apostle Paul prays for this church. We would see how it is that our lives are supposed to be lived. So God, help us today. May your word direct us, guide us, and reveal to us what you would have us to know this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I, even in the, in the lost world, if you will, people use the term pray. And don't, I, I hope that you don't misunderstand uh, what I say this morning, but in the context of what I'm talking about on prayer here, uh, thinking of prayer, a lot of times people say, will you pray for me? I'm going through a hard time. Tony, will you pray for me? Uh, Gerald, will you pray for me? Or can I pray for you, Wade? Or can I pray for you, Jim? We, we use the terminology pray, not only in a church setting, but out in the world. There would even be people at shortstop that I would run into on, on, a, on a somewhat consistent basis that would say, well, pray for me, preacher. And a lot of times I may get that line as I go out of the store, or pray for me. Or even sometimes it may sound awkward or odd, but even out in the world, people will say they're praying for me. And, uh, or maybe you go to a hospital setting and, and obviously they would say, would you pray for us? Or will you be praying for my family? And in our modern technological world, we send out an email, would you pray for my father? And, and, then, and we somewhat feel encouraged because 800 people got this message to pray for so-and-so. Or I have a friend, Justin Conley in Illinois, uh, that his uh, daughter has uh, uh, leukemia. She's one year old. And, and so they put on the prayer chain. They put it on the prayer chain and they, maybe they put it on Facebook. Maybe they send out an email and maybe they take comfort that people all over the world are praying for them. Are you with me? And it's pretty standard stuff, right? Okay, I'm just one of those people that says, well, what are you praying for me? What do you want me to pray for you? I just think the content of the prayer has some level of significance. I'm afraid sometimes we use the terminology, praying for you, brother. And if I was actually to ask, what have you been praying, you might not know because maybe you were or were not. It's almost like I just feel better if somebody says they're praying. I'm going through a hard time. Pray for me. I'm praying for you. Oh, thank you. What are you praying for me? And what do you want me to pray for you? I, I, I don't think you ought to confront everybody with that question necessarily. It might cause some type of controversy that's not needed. But I think we can learn this morning, what type of prayers could we pray that truly have the blessings of heaven upon them? I want to pray for you. 
I want to pray for this church in a way that God is pleased with the prayer, but and that He would receive the prayer and act upon that prayer. I want to I want to pray in accordance with God. I, I want to pray that which I truly believe God would do for you. And so I think we can learn some of that from this passage. Not that it exhausts every area of prayer. But I find it fascinating that the Apostle Paul, if you look at all of his prayers, the priority of emphasis to the way that Paul prays is spiritual. I don't think that necessarily means we're not to pray for the physical at all. I'm not saying that. I just think that we switch it around and we do more praying for physical than we do spiritual. Okay? I'm not saying one or the other is wrong. I'm saying we ought to keep them in a biblical balance and that which is spiritual is far more important than that which is physical. Okay, So like if Paul was in prison with Silas and the 21st century was to pray for him, we would pray that he gets out of prison. Right? Help Paul get out of prison. But I think in the context of Paul's day and the understanding of his prayers, they would pray for him to have the spiritual strength to bring God glory while he's in prison, whether or not he ever gets out. The spiritual was of more importance than the physical, at least in the Apostle Paul's prayers. And so I want us to be reminded of that. Then I also want you to see this. When Paul prays, I believe that he starts out with what is the most important and addresses that, believing the other things kind of will take care of themselves. I personally think you can learn a lot when you hear from, about a man or from a man when you hear him pray. When I hear him pray, I'm going to know something about him. When I hear him preach over a consistent basis, I'm going to know something about him. And then also, I think when you get to a dying man's words, you learn a lot about the man. I'm going to die in the next five minutes. This is the last thing I have to say. I'm thinking the dying man is going to say that, which he has come to the conclusion after living a whole life is of such radical importance to him. Now, depending on the man, depending on the way in which he dies, we might get ascertain what he says. I say all that to say that the Apostle Peter seems to say generally the same thing that Paul is saying here in our passage. You get to the last verse that is penned by the Apostle Peter after viewing all of his life, going through all the trials and things that he went through, his last words of the dying man are this, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the greatest thing I can tell you. I'm dying, I won't be here tomorrow. Here's all of my counsel in one sentence. Grow in grace and and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you'll grow in those areas that your life would exhibit grace, receive grace, and give grace, And if your life will be a consistent growth in the knowledge of our Lord, you will profit well. All the things Peter could have said, all of the things that could be prayed about, we find the knowledge of God to be a priority for the apostles as they communicate it to the people. I think it's still true today. I think it's still true today that upon every thought that I have of First Baptist Church of Briar, out of every thought that I would have for you, that I would not cease to pray for you. Oh, well, yeah, our pastor prays for us. What is your pastor going to pray? I want to pray that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will. That's what I want more than anything, is that each individual person, each family that makes up this church, that you will be filled to the maximum with the knowledge of, of his will. Okay, that, that's the, the beginning emphasis of this passage here. So the reason, let us, as we now turn our attention to Colossians 1 9, here is the reasons that Paul is praying. Verse 9, the ESV starts out, it says, and so. 
You could translate, for this cause. This is precisely why. This is, in fact, why I'm going to pray. This is, this is the whole reason. Verses 3 through 8 are why he's going to pray the way he's going to pray. We've already looked at verses 3 through 8, but I want you to see, if I can do it just very quickly, I want you to see how the things in 3 through 8 are pretty much copied in verses 9 through 12. You'll see the same words. Let me bring those out for you. In verse 3, he gives thanks. In verse 12, he's giving thanks. In verse 3, it's always. In verse 9, not stop, doesn't cease. Verse 3, when we pray for you. Verse 9, praying for you. Verse 6, you understood. Verses 9 and 10, the knowledge. And they come from the same root word. Understanding and knowledge come from the same Greek word. And then you have bearing fruit and growing in verse 6. You have bearing fruit and growing in verse 10. So you see, all the things that he was thankful for in verses 3 through 8, now he's praying those things out in 9 through 12. This is an interesting motive, is it not? The things that I'm thankful for in the local church are the things that are motivating and stirring me to pray all the more that those things increase. The things that I'm thankful for that I see in your life, the things that I see happening, the growth that is observable, the knowledge that you're gaining in, your faith is increasing, your walk is being exhibited as a follower of Christ. I'm thankful for those things and they motivate me to pray that they would increase all the more. So thankfulness is a good motivator for prayer. You could, you could break that on down to your own family, the things you're thankful for in your children, the things you're thankful for in your grandchildren, the things you're thankful for in your spouse, the things that you see God is doing, they would motivate you to pray all the more upon their behalf. What a good motive for prayer. I think generally speaking, most of us end up praying because everything's bad. It's always good and right to go to God. It may be a good motive because everything's bad. I just want to balance it out a little bit. Go to God when you're thankful. Go to God when you see good things going on and take that as a motivation to pray that they would continue on. And so this is what Paul says. It's for that very reason that I am praying for you. Now, he says that he is asking specifically that they would be filled with the knowledge of his will. Now, that you may be filled. Well, who is doing the filling? In, in, uh, in the grammar of it, they would say it as a divine passive. Girls, you're going to stop. A divine passive. God is the one who is doing the feeling. He said, I'm praying that you be filled. Who is it that's going to fill you? Paul is asking that the God of heaven would fill you with the, 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 the knowledge of his will. What an interesting thing. Not based upon the Apostle Paul, not based upon Epaphras, not based upon any other thing. I want God himself to fill you with the knowledge of his own will. That's what he's asking for, that the God of heaven would do that for this local church. Knowledge. It's a word that has to do with grasping and understanding. It's a spiritual knowledge. It's perfection in knowledge. You can miss a lot of things in life, the Apostle Paul may say, but don't miss a right knowledge of God. There are many definitions and understanding of God out there. If you look at the Muslim world, they talk about God, but their God's name is Allah. You look at the New Age world, and you say, they talk about God, but their God is embodied in the earth, and we worship Mother Earth. There's all kinds of varieties and different definitions of God out there. Paul says, I want you to have a right knowledge of the will of this God, the only God, that God would give you a revelation of himself. Uh, one of the theologians, Goodspeed, says it would be, knowledge would be a clear knowledge. I want you to know God. 
The knowledge of His will. The knowledge of His will. Filled with the knowledge of His will. When you hear the word will of God, I think that perhaps you think something differently than what Paul is saying. The way that we typically understand will is direction for my life. Is it God's will for me to buy a house? Is it God's will for me to buy a car? Is it God's will for me to take this job or to take this job? Is it God's will for me to do this or to do that? We think of God's will being what does he want for my life? That's, that's fine in and on its own setting. I just don't think that was, that's what Paul is saying in the context of Colossians. What Paul is trying to get us to see is a deep and abiding understanding of God's revelation in Christ and what that means for the entire universe and for you. I want you to be filled with the knowledge of His will his will as of that which is in his son on the behalf of the entire universe and God's will in his son for you. That's different than whether I should buy a house or not buy a house. What we desperately need is a fuller, more complete understanding of the gospel. I want to understand exactly all there is to know about why God, how God, when God, what all the things are with God as to why He would send His Son to die on a blood-stained cross for the redemption of humanity that we may be adopted into the family of God. That is larger than my mind can contain. And I want to understand it fully. How is it that a God like that love a sinner like this? I want to comprehend how in John, the gospel, he can make such a statement as this, that the love that the Father had for the Son is the same love he has for me. I want to comprehend that because somehow if I can understand God's will in loving his Son and that same love is given to me, somehow I think that's going to affect everything about my life. That you be filled with the knowledge of his will. Now, it's at this juncture of the sermon, I'm afraid you might get you might be missing it and not making the connection. But somehow, only by the Spirit of God, you can stay with this. But the knowledge of God is absolutely crucial for everything about who you are in life now. The more you understand God and His purpose of redemption in His Son, if you truly grasp that, I'm just trying to explain to you that if you grasp that, it affects everything. It affects how you think. It affects your motives. It affects your decisions. It affects every aspect of how you do marriage, how you do family, how you do your job, how you treat your employees. It affects everything from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. A right knowledge of God affects everything you do. And contrarily, a wrong knowledge of God affects everything too. A low view of God necessarily produces a high view of self. If God's down here, the world becomes about me. A right knowledge of God, humility, submission. Everything of a right knowledge of God will permeate and affect more, more, and more. Listen, when I was 10 years old, my knowledge of God had an effect upon my life. At 10, at 15, my knowledge of God had an effect upon my life and on and on and on. But now at age 44, what I know about God has even a greater effect upon my life. Look at the life of Joseph in Genesis. His knowledge of God has emphasis, emphasis, emphasis to the point that a woman comes and tries to commit adultery with him. His knowledge of God affected his life. He takes off running. How can I do this great evil and... Sin against my God. His knowledge of God prevented adultery. It's his knowledge of God that affected him to respond the way that he responded. So I just want you to comprehend why this is so important that Paul would pray that they would be completely, totally filled with the knowledge of his will. I don't know, in a shorthand, if I know God loves fill in the blank. I know God loves, then I love. What I know about what God loves causes me to love what He loves. 
I know God hates six things he hates. Seven are an abomination to him. I know he hates these things. Well, you know what? If God hates them, I hate them too. I hate a lying tongue. I hate one who goes around sowing discord among his brethren. Because God hates that. I hate that. But God loves this. God loves a cheerful giver. I love cheerful givers too. We, we begin because our knowledge of God, it affects us. God loves this. I'm all for it. God hates this. I don't want nothing to do with it. My knowledge affects the whole reality of my life. Now, with that, he says, filled with the knowledge of his will, and the ESV says, all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Okay. I don't think it's the best way to do that phrase, but all those words are there. Spirit, wisdom, and understanding. All three words are there. Different translations put them in different orders. I'm just giving you my order. He asked they'd be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and all understanding. And then you have this word spiritual. Okay? So I'm going to put those together and I'm going to say it like this. He is praying that the Holy Spirit of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit who actually works in Baptist, hello? I mean, the charismatics say we don't have the Spirit, but I'm convinced from Scripture that the Spirit of God works in Baptist as well. The Spirit of God is the one, the active person of the Trinity, who gives me wisdom that only He can give. He gives me understanding that only He can give. That's what Paul is praying. I want you filled with the knowledge of His will, but on your own you can't get it. You're going to need the Spirit of God to grant to you the wisdom from on high. You need the Spirit of God to give you understanding. There's two guys. They're walking down the Emmaus Road. You remember the story, the Gospel of Luke. They're walking down the road. A third person joins them. Hey, guys, what are you talking about? And they say, are you the only person in all this whole place that don't know what's going on in Jerusalem? They say, there's a guy, Jesus, come, they crucified, they kill him, they put him in a grave. Don't you know anything? And then it's like, where have you been? And somewhere in the process, opens their eyes. Oh, my goodness. This is Jesus with us. It was blind. Some, it had to be open. Had to be, the, 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 the hearts had to be softened to, to realize what's going on here. Paul is saying, in order to have the wisdom that God gives, in order to have the understanding that God gives, we need the Spirit of God to open our eyes, to soften our heart, to give us the view that we need. We are dependent not upon the seminary, not upon necessarily the pastor, not necessarily upon the Sunday school teacher, not necessarily upon my mother or my father. I need the Spirit of God to open my eyes. I pray that you would be filled with the knowledge of His will, but I pray the Spirit of God would give you wisdom as to what the will of God is. I pray the Spirit of God would give you understanding and comprehension to what the will of God is. We cannot come to these things apart from the Spirit of God. Now that's what Paul prays. Why? Why? I want you to be filled with the knowledge of His will. I want the Spirit of God to give you wisdom. I want the Spirit of God to give you understanding. Why? Because as Christians, you have to live. You have to walk. You have to exist. I want you, FBC Briar, including myself, I want you to walk live in a manner that is worthy to the Lord. You cannot walk worthy of the Lord if you don't know His will and you don't have spiritual wisdom, you don't have spiritual understanding. You can't walk in a way that is worthy of the Lord. You cannot be fully pleasing to Him. That's why I'm praying these things. I know that the Spirit of God must work in you to reveal these things to you because then you'll be able to walk the way that you're supposed to walk. That's what Paul is getting at. Knowledge affects my life. What I know of Him affects the way I live. You cannot, as some of us have done in Baptist churches over the years, you cannot separate the two. Well, I got saved when I was six. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to live like hell till I get there. The, the, the text will not do that for you. 
because God hath redeemed me through his son and changed my heart and made me new and old things have been passed away. Because that's happened, now I'm walking differently because that's the result of my knowledge of him. Knowledge affects my actions how we conduct our lives. Yeah. Proverbs 2, 12 through 20, I'll pass the reading of it, uh, but it has filled in that section of Proverbs 2, 12 through 20, wisdom and walk, wisdom and path. Wisdom and the way we conduct ourselves are tied intric intricately together in uh, Proverbs 2, 12 through 20. I'm going to move on from there, though. Walk in a way that is worthy of the Lord. To walk in a way that is worthy of the Lord is to walk in conformity with our union with Christ and His purposes for our lives. I'm in agreement. I'm unified together unto or with my Lord. Lydia, you're going to have to move over there. It's too distracting. Go down there. Worthy of the Lord. I want to live out that which I know is pleasing to Him. It's kind of like, in a sense, like in Psalms 1. Uh, walk in the counsel of the wicked, stand in the seat of sinners, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But I'm going to delight. I'm going to find joy and pleasure. I'm going to delight in the law of the Lord. It's going to be my meditation all the day. I want to, to walk worthy is to walk in a way that is in agreement with Him. If you think about it with a family, if I'm going to walk in a way that is worthy or honorable unto my Father, I'm going to do that which I know that He would approve of. I'm going to walk in a way in a sense that it would agree with whatever His standards are. To walk worthy of the Lord. When I, I walk out in this world, my speech, my actions, the way I treat people, the way you treat people at the bank, the way you pe treat people at Walmart, the way you interact with society out there, how you do that is a reflection of your view of God. So if I have a high view of God and a right understanding of God, I want to treat people as if they're created in the image of God, that they actually have souls and they will spend eternity somewhere. Even the people I hate have souls. And so I want to love my enemy as myself because God's Word teaches me that. God's Word teaches me to, to treat others with kindness and to love my neighbor as myself. And so I want to act that way even to the unlovable because of what I know about my God. Worthy of the Lord. Fully pleasing. It comes from a sense of desire. I want to do something that would produce satisfaction. Uh, the Phillips translation would say, I want to bring joy to his heart. The Moffat translation, I want to give him entire satisfaction. I want my life to give entire satisfaction to God. I, I want to live in such a way that God looks down and says, man, I am pleased with him. Have you ever thought, maybe, I don't know if you've thought this way or not. Tomorrow's Monday. And you're going to get up. You're more than likely eat breakfast or grab a donut on the way. Red Bull and a, uh, a dozen donut holes goes a long ways. Add in a five-hour energy drink. And you're going to start your day. How is it that I could live on Monday in a way that would please my God? What would be pleasing to God for my Monday? I'm not going to fill in all the blanks. Think through it yourself. How am I going to live tomorrow to be pleasing to Him? Because my heart loves Him. I love Him more than anything else. And if there's anybody on the face of this planet I want to please, I want to please God. What would please Him? Look, you're able to do that. If you actually have love for a spouse, you have love for your spouse to any kind of degree, you think, what would make her, him, happy? What would be pleasing to them? What would, you know, if you wanted to show affection to a spouse, you say, if I do this, I know it'll bless them. And man, it'd, it'd please them to no end. Some of you guys, you'd come home and vacuum the house. And they'd be like, man, your wife would fall over dead. You know, she'd be, wow, I know that'd please her because I'd never done that. Well, how could I please God with my life? And do you realize that? Your actions that you do 
tomorrow, through this week, are actions that could bring pleasure to the heart of God. Do you, you understand? I mean, can you see that? That by my knowledge of His will, I have wisdom and understanding that the Spirit has given me, and now I'm walking in a way that is pleasing to Him. What a concept. He says, why are you doing that? So I want to bring joy to the heart of my Father. You want to who? I want to bring joy to my Father. How are you doing that? My Father is God, and He's pleased when I do this. I want to be fully pleasing to Him. Now, He gives us four participles, and I'm just going to smash all these together and deal something with it next week. I, just, just look at the words, think through it, and let me give you one more what I think is a glorious truth or a, a gold nugget that you can take home with you. Here's four things that I think bring out this idea of being fully pleasing to Him. Are you ready? Tony's ready. Okay. Okay, here it is, Tony. Bearing fruit. The next one, increasing, again, in the knowledge of God. Increasing. Thirdly, strengthened. Fourthly, giving thanks. This is what's pleasing. Bearing fruit, increasing, strengthened, and giving thanks. Four things that would be fully pleasing unto Him. Now, I'll come back to this next week, but for this morning to, to kind of just end it somehow, look at verse 11 and look at this phrase. The strengthening, and I'm going to say, the strengthening to be able to live in a way that is worthy of the Lord. Let me tell you, you can't do this on your own in your own flesh. You can't live a life that is pleasing to the Lord by yourself. You need help. I need help. You can't make it. You don't have the strength. You don't have the smarts. You just, you just don't have it. So I need to be strengthened. He says that he is praying for them to be strengthened. And now in, in this translation, with all power according to his glorious might. You know the word, you ever heard preachers use this Greek word dunamis? which is where they say we get the word dynamite from. They usually use it when they talk about Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. Well, this verse 11 takes the noun power and the verb power and puts them together. I want you to be strengthened with all the power of the Godhead strengthening you. All that God is... His very, I want to say, intrinsic glory. Everything that God is, that that God would personally, in your life, give you the strength that you need to live a life that is worthy to Him. Now you just think for just a, a brief moment of the power of God. Johnny said it earlier when he quoted that verse, he would hang the world on nothing. The power of God to speak and there's nothing and he speaks and we have creation that's our God our God walks on water our God raises the dead our God gives sight to the blind our God cleanses the leper our God is infinitely powerful to do all things that God Paul prays to that that God would personally involve himself in you to strengthen you to be able to live a life that is worthy here's what we do church Here's what we do. I can't do this. I can't do that. We'd be like Moses. I, I can't talk. I'm not smart enough. I don't have this. We have a list of excuses as long as the Sunday morning paper. It's an affront to the Godhead. How so? I can't live a life worthy to you but yet my Bible teaches me that God, by His intrinsic power, will enable me to live a life that is worthy to Him. My response should not be, I can't do this. I'm not able to live a life like that. I'm not that spiritual. I'm not this. I'm not that. Here's what our response should be. God, I'm weak. I'm pathetic. I'm ignorant. I can't accomplish anything. I don't even know how to tie my shoes half the time. That's why I wear boots. Lord... Will you, by your supernatural power, enable me by your Spirit to live my life this day in a way that would be pleasing to you? I need your help. 
I'm responsible, I'm accountable, and I know I'm going to be held accountable for what I do, and that's why I even more desperately need your help. I struggle in sometimes communication with my wife, I struggle in communication with my kids, I struggle with my boss at work, I struggle with my neighbor across the street, I fail here, I fail here, I'm weak here, and I'm weak here, and God, if I'm going to do this thing in any way that's going to bring you honor, I'm going to need your help today. And I know that the Apostle Paul says that we are strengthened in perfect accordance with your power that is working in us. So I need that today. Daily. That's where we ought to be. And so we find everything we need in Him to enable us to live out this life. I can't save myself, I can't keep myself, and I can't sanctify myself. So throughout the whole of my life, I am in desperate need of God to work in me. And lastly, if you don't, you've not come to repentance, you've not come to faith in the Lord Jesus, you've not followed through in believer's baptism, what is your response this day? Look, all you can do apart from God is you can go from one sin to the next sin to the next sin to the next sin to the next sin. You, you take this sin, and, and I hear people all the time, well, I stopped smoking. Okay, great. I don't know how that's going to help. You just replaced it with drinking. Oh, well, I stopped drinking. Well, you replaced it with sleeping with people outside of marriage. Well, I stopped that. Well, I replaced that with pride. And well, I stopped my pride, and I just replaced that with self-centeredness. And I replaced, and I, it doesn't help. What you need is to cry out and say, I'm a desperate, wicked sinner, and unless Christ saves me, there's no hope for me. I need the power of God to give me a new heart and a right spirit that I can actually worship the living God. I need conversion. I need to be born again. I need to take an old dead life that I have totally ruined, and I need it to be washed away, and I need a brand new life, and God, I've heard you're the only one who can accomplish this kind of a miracle. I need a God who can take my dead life and do away with it and raise me from the dead that I would be a follower of Christ for the rest of my life. And apart from that, there's no hope for me. And you cry out until he gives you peace, and you spend the rest of your life pursuing him for he is worthy of our pursuit. Let us pray. Father,